Danny started his career as a digital marketing manager in Bralima, the biggest brewery in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and a subsidiary of the Heineken Company. Even though having a great job with a bright career future, he decided to start his own media company, The Point Zero, and become a full-time filmmaker. He represents the well-educated, inspiring, and entrepreneurial millennials of Congo, and we are very glad to have him as our guest today, talking about his career and his entrepreneurial journey. Hi, Danny. Welcome to our podcast. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you. It's been such a long time, and I'm glad to finally be on your podcast. Indeed, it was such a long time, and we were working together in Congo, in Kinshasa, and you had a dream job for many people. How did you actually start it? Well, professionally, it's a very simple story. It's the story of somebody who I, I remember when I was a kid, when I was around thirteen to fourteen years old. We used to go on these、uh, field trips for the school. And one time, I had to, to. I went to visit Bralima, which is like the biggest brewery in Congo that is owned by Heineken International. We went to visit it, and it was such a, an amazing experience for me in terms of in terms of just seeing how a big factory, a big company works with so many people working to, together to to make this thing work and to add value and to bring value to the market. Because at the time. Uh, and it hasn't changed since then. But Bralima is like the biggest historical company in Congo. It's like the oldest of the companies that exist now. And it's like, in terms of its contribution also to the economy of the world of the, of the country, it's the biggest. So it was. It's become a dream. I remember saying a lot of times that my first and last job will be at Bralima, because I want. I wanted to. to I wanted to contribute. To the biggest company in the economy, so there was not even it was not even a question. So, first time I had a chance to apply for a job locally because I first、uh, lived for a couple of years in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So when I came back, ready to take over the market and the, to to bring to to, to contribute to, to however I could, the first stop was Bralima. I needed to get there. I needed to get in and. This is what happened to me. So I went in as a as a trainee, and slowly and surely I started to to to, to go, let's say, higher in the ranks. And I showed so so much potential that it's kind of my career was like like a clear path. I knew where I would end up if I just keep working hard, if I could, I just keep having the right attitude. But then someday I just decided that that wasn't good enough for me anymore. That I needed something more. Yeah. And what triggers you actually take the steps and start something else? I think at first it came from I would say my education, but my personal education, because very young I was introduced to the world of personal development and personal growth, all 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 those big movements coming from the U.S. And so I've always been fed with all these ideas that one man should change the world or try at least. And that everybody has a purpose that he has to find in life, and that I needed to know what my purpose is and what my contribution is to the world. And also, I grew up with so many models that was all self-made people, self-made men, people like John Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie. So I grew up with these people, and Steve Jobs was like the main main inspiration. And so it was like. I didn't have, even have a choice, but I knew that okay, I'm here to learn, I'm here to progress, I'm here to 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 know how to work because working is an is an art and a science. I needed to how to become a professional before I could like jump into the unknown and try to start something of, of myself and contribute to the to, to the country and to the economy. And do you find it risky to quit your? Dream job and then start something on your own. It is very risky, especially in, a, in an economy like Congo, because Congo is like a third world country. So many things. You you've been here, so you've you've had a glimpse of what's the status of how the people live, how the economy works, 
what's the purchase power of the, con the, 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 the Congolese, and it's very low. So it's a country where there's not enough jobs. So yeah, it was, at first, I'd say it was stupid to leave it all because so many people would kill, literally, to be in the, in the same position, especially at, at, at such a young age because I was... I was in the company from like 20 years old or 21 years old, since I was 21 years old. So it's very young, especially in Congo, because in Congo, even when you're 40 years old and you're in a company, you're considered to be very young, still learning, you see? So the, the perception here was that I was so ahead of my time and to be able to, to, to risk it for, for the unknown, because in the end, entrepreneurship is going into the unknown. Not knowing, and not knowing what's going to happen, not having any experience, because you, you cannot just wait till you have all of the experience in the world and jump, because sometimes you just need to learn on the field, to learn as you progress, to learn as you fail. So it was a big risk, yeah. And how did you plan your career change? Did you have a master plan or just jump into it? Well, the first thing I did actually was when I decided to leave my job, at first it was like an impulsive decision, meaning maybe at some point I was unsatisfied with the status quo and I just decided that, okay, it's time to go. And I just quit my job. And then something great happened. Now I see why it was, it was great. Something great happened. We, at the same time, we have a big change of management in the company and the new GM that came and met me and discovered that I, I quit my job and I was going to leave like in a month or two. Uh, we had a great contact together. So he told me, okay, I just met you and I would like to know what it's like to work with you because I feel like you can bring something to my project and my vision. And please don't leave so soon. Don't leave now. So what we, we agreed on is that I was going to last one year longer before I could decide if I wanted to, to, to leave again. Uh, so that made it easier for me because now I had a full year to prepare for what I was going to do. So it, it was a great, great opportunity because uh, I just realized that if I jumped just right out of the blue, I was going, it, was going to, it was going to become very, very much difficult because I would just be in uh, drown into just discovering everything at a, at a time. And now I just had a full year to have the time to prepare the business plan, to analyze the market better, to talk with people who are entrepreneurs. And I took a, a mentor as well, somebody who, who was a great, great friend of mine, and but who was like 10 years or 20 years ahead in terms of business, in terms of skills, in terms of knowledge of the market, and in terms of failures as well. So it really helped me move through this transition. And that really made, made it easier for me, I think. Right. And after you quit your job, you started your own company. So what are you doing now? What I'm doing now is that I have a production, a video production company or an audiovisual production company. So the, basically what it means is that, is that we produce films, documentaries, TV commercials for either companies, but also for like the greater audience that is going to consume it itself. So this is what we do now. But it, it's shifted as well from when I quit my job, like uh, it's four years now. It shifted because at first it was a, a, bas a, a classical communication agency, an ad agency. It was classical. So we were working from marketing strategies for clients to making TV ads to to creating, to create digital campaigns. But for the last two years, I'd say that I've been focusing, because you cannot just do everything. It's also a big mistake to think that because you love so many things that should be, and that you're maybe good as, at all of those things, that should you, you should embrace all of them. That was a mistake at first. And it was a huge, huge, huge difficulty for us that we met like the first two or three years. And then we decided to specialize now, to do what, to do one thing at a time and to just be the best at it. And we found that audiovisual production is such an empty market here in Congo because content, we don't have local content. 
what uh, it's almost 80% of what you see on TV or online in Congo is still some coming from abroad. So there's such a huge market locally to, to, to bring local content of quality. So we specialize on that now. And your company is called De Point Zero, so 2.0. What is the story behind this name? So De Point Zero means 2.0. And actually, the company shifted. The, when I created the company like four years ago, the name was, was so creative, so creative. So that was our mindset. Because we, we were thinking of ourselves as this new force on the market of aid agency, we didn't fear anything. We're so fresh in our ideas because it was all millennials. It was very young team, very open-minded kind of people. So the name was so creative, but then at some point we shifted toward the point zero, 2.0 because it was 2.0 kind of, kinds of means so creative 2.0. So it's like an evolution of it because the, the vision also has evolved. We, can, we couldn't just stay the same when our vision was so precise and clear now. And I also know that you create a series of video having conversations with local entrepreneurs or people who, have, who are very inspiring to the, in the community. And where did you yeah. get this inspiration from to, have, to construct this kind of content? So at some point when we're in the shift of the transition from So Creative to 2.0, the idea was, okay, how can we stop just delivering value to clients who are capitalist companies, some companies, you know, sometimes we were working with, with clients we didn't believe in, or we didn't believe they offered something of value to the local community. Because today, business and marketing shouldn't just be about selling things. It should be about, about bringing value. And it was becoming so important for us to work with company who had a beautiful, philosophy of work as well as a beautiful who took responsibly their re social how do you say it? societal responsi uh, responsibility you see what i mean so it was very important so at some point we fell, we fell out of love with working just for clients because it came it came with so many so many constraints that we are not feeling anymore we weren't creative anymore and we weren't taken for we were kind of taken for granted so we did that shift. So the idea was, how do we now create, create really relevant content? And I've always wanted to try myself and making videos and being like a, a host of a, TV, a web show or a podcast, some, something like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really starting to like it. And it's, it's kind of uh, working in terms of I'm getting awareness toward it and people are loving it. And, and it's, it's kind of feeling feeling good, and I just I just want to see and do it for long the longest of time and see where it can it can put me. But yeah, the, so the, uh, the the inspiration was coming from the the main podcasts and TV shows that I'm seeing from the US. As I mentioned, the US culture and media landscape is like a huge, huge, huge inspiration for me in everything I do. So it was just natural, and I tried it, and it's working well, and. It's a beautiful opportunity to show to local Congolese, young Congolese, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to show them people who are either ahead of them or either in a di another direction, going in, a di in another direction, just to inspire them to know what are the steps that they can take to, to become who they, they, they're supposed to be. And how did you choose topics? Uh, at first, it's the, the topics that I'm passionate about. So it's, uh, it's societal topics. I love talking about society, where our world is going, capitalism, uh, new technology and how it's impacting the world, uh, women and their role in our societies, especially in African societies, because women have a specific, a different role, I mean, than in Western-minded countries. And so it really is about everyday life topics but it's uh, tackling them in such a way that we can always get something popular or something in inspiring out of it because it's not just about talking about like the news i don't like to talk about the news i like to talk about universal 
messages, some things that are relevant in time, because I think that's, that's what we need here locally. So, and also sometimes when I receive somebody who's such an expert on, on a specific dom domain, on a specific field, I'd like to talk about what he knows about and, and just to go with the flow and to, to see where it, bring, it, bring, it brings us. To. And what are the topics that interest you personally in your videos? So mainly it's about entrepreneurship, meaning that whatever topic we find, we tend to want to solve the entrepreneurship question in, in that topic. For instance, if we talk about, uh, I was talking about the influencers marketing or how people have become brand by themselves and how now people live out of their popularity online and on, you know, so even that was a, an opportunity to see how now youngsters and millennials can simply just not, don't have to look for a job, a job that they would hate for, to work for a boss that they wouldn't respect. Now, because the internet has given us such, so much opportunities to brand ourselves, it's an opportunity for entrepreneurship. You know, it's an opportunity to get people to know who you are, what you do, what you believe in, what your area of expertise is, and you can work your way, you can become an, an, entre an entrepreneur just coming from that. So all the subjects like, uh, for instance, when I was telling you about women and feminism in general, it was a beautiful subject to know, okay, how can we focus on becoming a better community for women to thrive as entrepreneurs as well? How do women get to redefine themselves in a, in a country or in an Africa where women are so minimized, are so undervalued? And even at the world stage, because you still have so many countries where women don't have the same wages as men, women don't have the same advantages as men. And here in Africa is, is deeper because we are such a traditional society as think. And so all the topics, tend to want to, to answer the question, how do we make entrepreneurship better locally? Have you already seen a growing trend that people start their own business in Congo? Yes, definitely. But it's kind of a necessity because you simply just don't have en enough jobs for everybody who look for a job. This is the reality here. So being an entrepreneur here is not just about wanted to become your own boss or wanted to become a millionaire. It's like a survive, survival thing. Of course, for millennials, for some portion of the population who are kind of comfortable, comfortable in their skin or in their life or in their families, who live in modest families, they tend to want entrepreneurship for all the pretty reasons. But most of Congolese people are entrepreneurs by nature. Everyone sells something. Everyone is doing business somehow and everyone is a commerce commerciant or a trader and it's such a so it's part of it's part of the the mindset the local mindset but it's also part of a mindset that i think has a lot of flaws in the sense that the, we are more about trying to get by than trying to create companies that are going to bring values so we, this, type of, this type of entrepreneurs, we don't have enough of it, I would say. Also, I think because we tend, especially young people from today, we tend to want to become entrepreneurs for so many wrong reasons. Me, I'm the first, to, we went into that direction. I think a, a bad reason to become an entrepreneur is, for instance, to want to become your own boss. You know, because th these are so... I think you should want to become an entrepreneur because you identify needs that you feel like you can provide, you can solve, or that you have uh, felt like there is not enough jobs in a specific areas that you want to provide for something. But if you want to become an entrepreneur because it's going to make you rich, <laughs> this is such a wrong way to, 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 to tackle it because entrepreneurship is so hard. You have to be passionate about it. You have to really love what you do and you have to, 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 to really love the hardship and the process more than just the, the, the destination of what, where you want to go. So 
this is the shift of mind that we need. We millennials from Congo, especially, or from Africa, and even the world, and and especially, and that's why I try to do as well in my shows and in the the kind of content that I put online now. It's about trying to re-inspire people to a new mindset that is like a real mindset because we just a lot of us don't simply live in the real reality if i can speak it like that say it like that what do you mean by not living in the real reality uh it means that we want to become entrepreneurs but we don't want to to give up comfort for some time for instance, okay, if I want to, I, I, I love being, we love living in beautiful apartments, beautiful places, having these huge 620 inches TVs. We love that. But being an entrepreneurship, an entrepreneur is about making sacrifices, especially at first. You don't, you don't want to become in a position where your company needs to, you need to get, to get money from your company for yourself at first, because every opportunity to save money every opportunity to reinvest the money that the company is making should go into that it shouldn't go into into paying for your for your luxuries paying for what you want so a lot of us want to become entrepreneurs but are not already ready to give up on the like the short term comforts that is going to bring us the long term value and long terms uh if, if you see what I mean. So that's what I say, I mean by we don't live in the real reality in, in that way, because the reality is that we need to give, it, give up on so many things for so long. Sometimes it could take up to five years. Sometimes it could take up to 10 years. Sometimes it could take up to forever. But it's, if you're still more interested in, in the process, in the value that you will bring, in that sense, there, there will not be failure. Even if you, do, you don't become a millionaire in the process, you still can make a real change if you change, you shift your perspective. Yeah. Right. It's, and it's so important that you find something you really, really enjoy doing because despite all the difficulties, that will keep you going. If you just go for entrepreneurship for the wrong reason, any difficulties will beat you down. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think I, I myself, at some point, I, I find myself in a position where I felt out of love for what I was doing. But I just understood that it was not about what I was doing. It's not, it was not about the core, the core business that I was into. But it was about how I was approaching it. For instance, I was working for so terrible clients that they made me hate my job. They made, made me hate the process of creating content, of making videos, making ads. Because I was just simply doing it for the wrong people in the wrong way. So at some point, what we had to do was to decide that we need to give up the comfort that we're having now because we are going very fast. Uh, the first two years of the company, we held almost uh, like $500,000 of income and revenues. Like the first two years is a lot of money in Congo for a young company that is starting. Uh, 500,000 US dollar in revenue. Yeah, less revenue, not like in profits, not profits, in revenue, just in turnovers, the money that was coming and was going, the money that was moving inside the company. Yeah. That is like half a million of US dollar, which is not many <laughs> startups can, startup can, you can achieve that. <laughs> Yes, indeed, this is a gigantic amount of revenue for a startup in the first year. Exactly. Like, it was the first two years, but it's a huge amount of money to manage, especially when you don't have enough, uh, ex enough experience, I would say. And it was also the, the one of the reasons that the company failed so, so big after that, because... I think there's a principle in life or in business or in the universe that wants that everything has to grow piece by bit by bit. We had so many opportunities at once that it was becoming very hard to seize them in the right way. We felt very comf comf comfortable. We went from a company of like three to five employees and in like six months we had like 20 people 
and managing them was just a mess because you need to manage egos, you need to manage to teach people your way, your philosophy, your way of working. And it was becoming, the company had just become too big for us to manage. And we was getting crazy. We thought that, okay, now we're about to become millionaires, so we can start to live like that. And we just made so many wrong decisions so many times that we started crash pretty fast, pretty fast. And you just realize that, okay, you don't need that, many, that much money to build something of value. Just, you just need the right process and the right philosophy and to learn the right lessons. And you can have less money than that and achieve much bigger things. When you say that the company is crashing very fast, do you mean by losing clients or losing employees? We started by losing clients first because we, was, we weren't just able, we thought that having a lot of hiring new people, just hiring a lot of people would help us manage two, three, four, five clients at a time. But you just realize that it doesn't work like that because all these people need to work as a unit. They need to work with the same philosophy of being of service to the client. So some clients just naturally become out of priority meaning that we give, we give them the minimum service in terms of quality, in terms of respect of deadlines. And some people took it, some clients took it personal, some uh, jeopardized the way we were working. So the payments were, become, were coming more slow, slower, or some people just uh, decided that we needed to stop our partnership there. So we, this is how you know, things started to, to fall and we, we, we find ourselves in a, into a debt, a, a big debt that was hard to manage because we didn't have the, the cash flow to, to, to just manage it daily. And it was very, very difficult at some point. Well, from half a million revenue to being in debt. In like two and a half years. So it's a crazy story. Yeah. It's a crazy story. But yeah, yeah but, but in terms of lesson learned, because it was still a small debt, because you don't want to have a half a million dollars debt, kind of debt. It was a very, it was a small enough debt to make us realize that we were just going in the wrong direction. But it was a small enough, well, it was a big enough debt that it made us realize that we were going in the, in the wrong direction. But it was so small enough that we knew we, it allowed us to make the right adjustment to, to now do things in a different way, yeah. Is that the reason why you brand, rebranded your company as The Point Zero? Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons, because one of our main uh, investors also decided that he didn't want to work to partner with us anymore. So yeah, so out of three associates, just two of us go, the founders, the founding member, members, just we went in another direction and the investor just decided that, okay, we didn't do the things the right way and we needed to, 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 to go separate ways. But he, he, he didn't give us, I think, the right support to be able to, he didn't help us grow because he was the, the guy who already had companies, already had a lot of a background. So we felt like he didn't give us the support when we needed to, but maybe, maybe we, were, we weren't also listening. You know, when you're young and you're starting and you have all these big dreams and you feel like you know how you're going to manage it, you tend to, to not listen too much to, to, to people who are trying to tell you this, the, the direction you're taking is the wrong way. So after your rebranding, after you find a new direction for the company, what does your company focus on right now? Okay, so right now, like for the past two years, but like, like on a regular basis for the past 12 to 15 months now, it's about the main, the main thing we do is we produce documentaries, documentary films. So, and it's a great way of doing things because it, we want to focus on content with added value, not just commercial content. We want content that, okay, it can be of service to a particular brand or company, but it's also ed educative and entertaining in a way that it brings value to, to the end consumer. So mostly documentaries, web shows as well, web series, like we produce, we're producing actually right now a, a, web, a series that is called We Are Entrepreneurs, Nous Sommes Entrepreneurs, that is focusing on telling the stories of entrepreneurs, 
you, so it's a day in the life of a different entrepreneur in each episode that is where we go through his routines, his philosophy. We, grow, we go as well physically with him throughout his day to know what, kind, what type of entrepreneur is he. Is he a, a guy who wakes up at 5 a.m. start to work? Is he a guy who will, will prefer to work to, to, to sleep late and to send email before going to sleep? Is he a guy who would like to start off the day by a meeting or, you know, just showing Congolese people what an entrepreneur is and made in uh, local entrepreneurs. And this is the type of shows that we're producing right now. I'll maybe send you some links to some stuff that we produce and you, you'll see and you, you give me your feedback as well. Definitely. I'll be glad to do that. And what do you think are the differences between your generation and the previous generations in your country? I think... We are the generation with the most unstable economy. This is a reality. My father was at a university and got picked up by a company when he was at the university, like in the first or second year. So he had a full year knowing that his future was already taken care of. But we are the generation that is so uncertain of of what is going to be, what the future is going to be made of that we live in kind, some kind of, we have a lot of insecurities in, in that sense. So the approach also is different, meaning that we are no longer driven by security because we know that there's no security. We are driven by purpose. And our, uh, when I see the previous generation was also a generation that could be content with just being well paid, that with money. And my generation is looking for a purpose, looking for happiness in a job, looking for a job that makes us grow, looking for a job that, that is really taking care or being in, is really interested in my personal development. It's not just that you become a better professional, but they, we want a job that's also interest, that is also interested in knowing how my family is growing. So I think that makes us so volatile in such a way that we can lose, that's how we can lose a great opportunity, a great job, because we just want something more. And we can do it with so, so much ease, much more ease than our, the previous generation did. Because we know that, okay, this life is short and so many things can go wrong. I can, you can, I can stay in my job for 10 years and just one day make a small mistake. And one day the company needs to Revaluate everyone, or just to need to shrink down the, the personnel, and just in once again, your whole life can change if you didn't prepare. So we are very volatile. We're not faithful anymore to the marketplace or to opportunities. We like to shift things, and I think it's also a great thing that that's also a great advantage of our generation in a way that we are only we don't we only want to bring the most value. It's non-negotiable, yeah. And you're creators. You want to create something that fulfills you rather than settling down. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's like we are a generation of artists, of people who have learned to, to speak their hearts. So everybody wants to do something that is profound for him. And everybody wants to be a creator in some way. Whether you're in agriculture, whether you're in the filmmaking, Everybody wants to make a brand out of, out of its, its way of doing, and it's beautiful to watch. What if the audience want to watch some of the videos you have produced or follow you on social media? Where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on all the social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm not so much on Twitter. I should be more. Uh, and YouTube as well. And it's just my name, Danny Bavuidi. Everywhere it's the same. And they, they will see great content. It's too bad that uh, everybody recommends me to start putting English subtitles to my content for them to have a broader audience as well. So I might be thinking of doing that. And, uh, but yeah, mostly on all social media platforms. Yeah. Since I've been making videos, it's, be, it's brought me so many work opportunities in terms of contracts, in terms of uh, production opportunities that maybe, yeah, maybe I'm in too comfortable to and focusing just on my French speaking audience, but definitely there's so many content that are, I think, universal, universally relevant 
I, I recently did a video uh, talking to women in general, and I was just surprised by the buzz and the, how it went viral. I, I, I got call from people from the US, from people from Canada, from people from uh, South Africa, who just resonated with what I was talking. And I, I want to add as well that what is good with us millennials is that we kind of so different but the same at the time. Whether, that you live, whether you live in Switzerland or in China or in Canada, we kind of resonate with the same things. We'll, a little bit different culturally, but since also it's about globalization, it's about, you know, when I see, for instance, the movement that had happened in the U.S. Uh, post-COVID about George Floyd and just racial injustices and the protests, and how we just took on, took on the world is a beautiful testimony that we are now becoming more and more of the same. We want the same thing. That is a better world, a better planet. Because I cannot just say, okay, I can focus on Congo and what, I, what is happening here. Because my impact on the planet in Congo is impacting a young girl in Malaysia. And then, so we need to, more than ever to become one in terms of how we do things. And entrepreneurs, I think, and we can play such a great role into regulating the mindset, regulating the way we do business, the way our business can become clean uh, for the planet and for social, for the society around us. So I think it's just a beautiful time to be alive now. Yeah, and also I totally agree with you that after talking with other guests, I also think that people share a similar mindset or very purpose driven regardless you are in congo you're in london or you're in other countries it's just a very interesting mm -hmm. observation that this generation people around this age group they are different from the previous ones but they are also similar in certain ways themselves yeah do you think it has to do something with internet the way that this generation is so different from the previous ones I think so. I think the information is much more accessible, cross-border, also mm -hmm. cross different languages. And then people read yeah. similar stuff. For example, all the um, personal development books that you read, I have also read them. Somehow we are influenced by this concept, by what the books is written. Yeah. And also YouTube videos, mm -hmm. or even international programs, TV shows, talk shows. Yeah, yeah. I agree, completely agree with that. All right. Thank you very much for your time. It was really nice pleasure talking to you. It was a beautiful pleasure for me. If you like today's content, make sure to subscribe, like, and share. See you in the next episode.